Hello and welcome to Right On, the podcast from Final Draft. This is the show where we talk about all things screenwriting. I'm your host, Phil DeLasso. Today we have a chat with Joshua Safran, showrunner of the new Gossip Girl on HBO Max. This revival of the classic series follows a new generation of New York's private school elites and all the trouble they get into. She is a stranger who has found herself in your friend group with your boyfriend. I promised I would stay away from any drama. Did you miss me? I know I've missed you. Gossip Girl, an anonymous Instagram account that spies on our students. This just in, there's a big secret amongst the ruling class at Constance Villa. Why is Gossip Girl out to get us? I'm not just known, I'm influential. And I can't have that taken away from me. Privilege and power will always win in the end. Maids come around too much. XOXO. Parents ain't around enough. Gossip Girl. Something's different. In a good way? In the best way. Joshua and I discussed what has changed in the decades since the original series aired, playing with audience expectations, how he got his start at the ripe old age of 11, and more. Check it out. I am here with Joshua Safran, creator of the new version of Gossip Girl on HBO Max. Thank you for taking the time to chat with me today, sir. Thank you so much for having me. So for people who might somehow be unfamiliar with uh, this this new version of the show, how would you describe it? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, I would say that in the intervening nine years since the last show, uh, when Gossip Girl went dark, you know, we are looking at how social media has changed the landscape of who we say we are and how we put ourselves out in the world. And so a new Gossip Girl rises, much like Game of Thrones, uh, <laughs> new of Thrones and uh, targets a new crop of young students at the Constance Billard School. And yeah, that's the best way I can put it. Chaos reigns. Exactly. Um, so you mentioned social media. And one of the things that you know, sort of struck me watching the, the new series is it seems like in a weird way, the kind of world has caught up with the world of Gossip Girl. And I'm just curious, you know, what your kind of thinking is on that and, you know, what your approach was to sort of, you know, leaning into that for the show or, you know, how you kind of rode that uh, that line. Well, sort of, it took me like a, a little bit of time to realize why the first show, because when I, when I came to do this show again, I was wondering why the first show had stood the test of time, because it really has. I mean, people are still finding it now. It was mm -hmm. the highest rated, high, very highly rated on Netflix even like six months ago before it moved to HBO Max. And I was like, why is that? And I was like, oh, it's actually because it was kind of a period piece, meaning we never tried to do anything future tech wise. It was simply what was available to us in that moment. And let's drive our plots through what's at our disposal. And so when it came time to do this show, I did the same thing. I was like, let's not try to predict the future of social media. Let's not try to predict the next app. Let's truly use what we have right now. So the show feels like it's set the moment you film it and not tomorrow. And I think a lot of shows that deal with tech often try to shoot it as if it's tomorrow. They want to seem when it's airing that it's like anticipating something. And I think the first time mm -hmm. we're at what Josh and Stephanie did and we, I, you know, helped to support was this idea that it's just simply what the characters have in that moment. So, so the, while the world has caught up to it, I also think that it is of its moment, you know, and mm -hmm. then you watch it, if you watch it five or 10 years from now, like you might be watching the original, you'll be like, okay, that's what social media was like in 2021. And, you know, another thing, and that kind of, you know, contrasting the two versions of the show is this not the new version being on HBO Max, obviously frees you up in terms of language and, and you know, what you can depict on screen. But also, you know, the, the original series sort of has, you know, because it has commercial breaks and things like that, there's a sort of built in, like a uh, so little bit more of a soapy sort of thing. Whereas yeah. the new version definitely has those elements, but there's also, you know, realism isn't maybe the word, but, you know, there's more of a sort of naturalistic storytelling approach. And, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about those two different modes of storytelling and how you, you know, kind of applied that to this new version. Totally. So I, I, the way I, I kind of look at the first show is that what people seem to remember the most from the first show is the later seasons. And what's really funny to me as somebody who was there from seasons one through five is that when the show started to get soapier, I'd say it was sort of like at the end of season two and into three, four, and five. And at that time, its audience was like, it's getting too soapy. But weirdly, <laughs> the world has caught up to that version of mm -hmm. teen soaps, meaning 
Bridgerton, Elite, Riverdale, they're more like the later seasons of Gossip Girl that the original show's fans sort of derided. Mm -hmm. And this time around, I looked back at the first season, the first season and a half, and what made us really care about those characters was, yes, the world was heightened and they still did some crazy stuff, but it was actually also very grounded. So I was like, okay, what's the version of that for today? So that means if this show gets five seasons, I'm sure people will be pushing people to the <laughs> somebody. But I also feel like Gen Z is a much more grounded. They don't the they height being heightened is not a space that they live in. Mm -hmm. They feel like reality is heightened enough. So I listened to sort of Gen Z and structured the show around that. And 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 they, you're right, the act breaks is a very astute observation. The lack of act breaks means we're not driving to a crazy plot turn every 12 minutes or every seven minutes. We're actually able to build it all the way and have it explode at one point. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that wouldn't on uh, without commercial breaks if you had a bomb going off every seven minutes it would start to be like what's even happening anymore so uh, <laughs> those things all provide a, 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 a commitment to more realism or less heightened stakes a commitment to gen z an idea to go back to the original version of the show where like when blair lost her virginity to chuck it wasn't over the top it was realistic and she felt really conflicted about it and it was an emotional journey so it's that version right now we're in the season one version of gossip girl sure. original and then we'll see what happens <laughs> something you know i've seen you talk a bit about and obviously has been written about this iteration of the show is it's sort of more inclusive nature of the in terms of the cast of characters and it's a bit more diverse both in terms of race and you know sexuality and things like that it seems like that was a conscious choice on your part your part because it you know is representative more of the you know the youth of today but as a you know a writer how did you, you know, and a showrunner, how did you kind of accomplish that? What kind of, was it a matter of surrounding yourself with voices who could speak to those things? How did, how, what was your approach, you know, in terms of that stuff? Yeah. So I, I you know, I, I've, this is the third show that I've created in all, each of those shows the centered around a non-white lead or leads. And I just feel like there's enough shows about white people on the air. And it's my job to reflect the world around me, to you know amplify voices, to use my position of privilege, to help others that did not have the privilege that I did. And that extends to the characters, the world. You know, I went to private school on the Upper East Side many decades ago. And even back then, it was more diverse than most shows that show private schools, including the original Gossip Girl. And so I wanted to reflect the world accurately and then also again i i just have the my goal is to not to not create shows with white leads you know yeah. in the, world. So, so the writer's room was is the writer's room is diverse and is you know it's an inclusive writer's room so where my other writer's rooms like it's very important again like i i don't know what it's like to walk through the world as a young black woman so it is important to have you know, mm -hmm. you know everything that you're representing on screen represented in your writer's room and your crew like that's just and of course, you know, we can always do better. We're always doing better. But like, that is incredibly important. I'm very, it's very, I'm very fortunate also that this crew is incredible. It's incredibly queer, incredibly diverse crew, which means for the actors as well, that they're not standing there looking out at a sea of white people mm -hmm. behind the camera. They are also seeing themselves reflected when they look out as well yeah. as the audience looking in. So no, that's great. And I, I, I bring it up and I, you know, I, to clarify I, it, it all fits perfectly within the world of the show, and it doesn't, it, it, you know, it does not seem performative to that extent. So I hope I wasn't implying that. It's just, oh, no, it's, no, it's, no, 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 no. yeah. Um, I I, you know, one other thing, and you know, so I'm 37. I watched the original show when I was in my, you know, mid 20s, and I'm watching, and you know, I, as much as anybody could relate to the show, I was like close enough in age. I'm watching this new version, and I just feel like a senior citizen. <laughs> uh, and I'm curious, you know, you know, you're, you're, uh, how many years? A decade older than when you worked on the show previously. How do you kind of plug into the the younger mindset? I mean, uh, you know, that is my job, right? That's our job as writers. Like we, whatever we research, we have to know it inside and out. Like I didn't go to the FBI, but when I wrote Quantico, I did that research. And that show is more accurate than I think people even realize. <laughs> and so like that, you know, smash, like I didn't, I didn't have a Broadway show, but like I, you, you just immerse yourself in the world and whatever research you do, it's not just academic. You're not just like, I didn't just read Twitter and I didn't just like read books about like Gen Z people. I spoke <laughs> to my friend's kids. I hung out at, you know, I, I like hung, I went to the Met steps, listened to conversations. I went, you know, you just go to restaurants, you start picking up, you start listening. You're on the subway, you're looking around. Like it just all comes in, into you. It's like, I always talk about how Amy Sherman Palladino wasn't alive in the fifties, but Maisel <laughs> a fairly accurate depiction about how that group of people probably existed. It's heightened also like Gossip Girl, but there's a lot of realism in it as well. And yeah. so 
that's your job, right? No one remembers how old, you know, James Baldwin was when he wrote about 20 year olds or how old Ian Forster was when he wrote about 16 year olds, you know, like that it's, that's the job of the writer. So, so that's my job. And I just <laughs> do my job and sure we had some young people in the writer's room, but frankly, I do <laughs> about the language. Of the writers had this joke that they would always just leave like, you know, they would leave the reference blank because they just knew that I would know the reference because that's what I do. <laughs> that's great. One of the things I've always loved about Teen So Gossip Girl is, is a great example of this is balancing the the sort of teen storylines with the parents and sort of intertwining to that. And I'm curious, you know, what's the approach there? Like, you know, in terms of figuring out how much weight to give one or the other, or how to, you know, cross them, how to cross pollinate them, you know, what, how do you go about that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think I learned a lot from Josh and Stephanie because the first time I read Lily and Rufus were series regulars. And so every episode dipped into them, but they obviously, they weren't taking the A story or the B story because that's the kids stories. They were taking sort of the C story. And mm -hmm. this time around, I think the teachers have filled into the parents' roles, meaning the teachers have privileged stories of their own. And I think most of the times they have the C story and that when we do see parents, which we do a lot, they're never in a privileged point of view. It's always, you, if you see Audrey's mom, Kiki, it's in a scene with Audrey. If you see Max's dad, they're in a scene with Max. They don't have their own scenes away from Max. And I feel like that means, because it's about Max, it's about mm -hmm. Audrey. It lives with her dad, it's about Julian. So I think you just kind of like fall into this pattern. But when you have the series regulars that you know you want to give story to, I think it's a great relief for the audience to, to see this other generation. I think that's why teen shows, it works so well. Like my so-called life, I'll always remember when I first watched my so-called life, I totally related to Angela. And then when I watched the show 10 years later, I totally related to her pair. I was in such shock over that. <laughs> How did that happen so quickly? But it just does. And I think it's great that these shows allow that. And they allow you to like mm -hmm. see things in a different way when you return to them. So... Yeah, I had a similar experience rewatching the OC recently with my girlfriend who had never seen it. You know, I was like totally. super into all the, the parent storylines. Totally. Uh, um, <laughs> it's life. Like, oh, yeah. it's both. You know, it's a really great thing. So, yeah. yeah. So you mentioned the teachers and one of the big differences between uh, the original show and this one is there's not really a mystery, at least right now, behind who is Gossip Girl. Was that something you came up with early on and were like, this is, you know, just the, the way to reinvent it? Or was it something you came, you know, you found later? No, I, I, that was the reason to do the show for me. So that, so I had, I, the idea that I had was that we needed to, Gossip Girl wasn't, it needed to be the teachers. And the reason for that was, um, you know, when we revealed who Gossip Girl, when they revealed who Gossip Girl was at the end of the first show, you never got to see Dan actually being Gossip Girl. You didn't get to see him sitting next to Serena on a date and she's like opening up to him about some horrible thing from her past and he's secretly writing it down. He's going to use it later to destroy her <laughs> even though he's in love with her. Like that entire element is missing. And so that to me was very fertile ground. Like it, like I'm, I'm glad we didn't show it the first time, but this time let's show it. Let's do something different. Like it's not the same show. If it was the same show, it would have Serena and Blair and Chuck and Nate and it doesn't. So what's the reason to do it again? And the reason to do it again is to look at some new angle and not to mm -hmm. just do the same thing. So that was really important to me. And also a story of playing God is always fascinating. We watch them all the time. I mean, again, like my Game of Thrones references, I always think about that <laughs> regarding this. Like you yeah. are invested in that show because you want to see what power does to something. And I think mm -hmm. on Gossip Girl, Gossip Girl was power, right? Or is power. So you kind of, the idea that now you can see what having that power really does to somebody <laughs> is intriguing. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, you were in the trenches of the original show. You're the creator and showrunner here. When you're, you know, okay, season one, how do you approach it? Do you, you know, you get together with the writers and you're coming up with all new characters. You have to plot out the season. You know, what was the, you know, from Colonel to you're in a room, you're putting cards up all over the wall. What was the, you know, what, how did, how did, how did it, how did it happen? Well, so, so Josh and Stephanie came to me and they asked if I wanted to do it. I said no initially. And then over the weekend, I was like, wait, I think I do. And in the meantime, I was working, I was running in the writer's room on my previous show soundtrack for Netflix. And so I didn't even know when I could get to gossip Girl. but I was hired to write the pilot. There, there it was a series order, but I still wrote the pilot and uh, came up with the pilot outside of the writer's room. So when the writer's okay. room began, it was all already devised. And then the okay. writer's room, Sort of worked on episodes two through 12. But initially, actually, we had a 10 episode order. So, what's really confusing about this show is there was a writer's <laughs> room. We did 10 episodes. We closed the story. And then COVID happened. And suddenly, we had an extra time to sort of refine and go back in. And what we ended up doing was they upped our order from 10 to 12. So, we actually had to go in and re break the last two episodes to make them four episodes, which I've never had to do before, which was complicated because, and then also, sure we didn't close the story because we are hope by that point, 
you know, everyone had read the pilot, they'd read other episodes and they were like, we think there's a lot here and the hope is there's more seasons. So sure. let's not do a limited series version of this. Let's, so, so that was really fascinating, but, but in the writer's room, you know, the way the writer's rooms work, work the way the, the right, eh, the way the writer's room worked on this show is different than most in that because I had episodes of the first one and I was in the writer's room every single day for that. I know the DNA of how to make the show inside and out. So this show is kind of a little bit like teaching. I kind of thought of myself as like Viola <laughs> Davis and how to get away with murder a little bit. I was being like, okay, this how we tell a Gossip Girl story. And then the writers would sort of fill that in because every Gossip Girl story has the same math. You meet all the characters, you see all their conflicts at a certain point, the end of act two, they're all in different trains and the trains are heading straight for each other. There's always an event. The trains hit each other at the event. The catastrophe happens. How do we work through the carnage? That's act four. And then in act five, the, we've worked through the carnage and now it's a new day. You get the very hint of everyone's like, but we're going to book passage on another train. <laughs> That's sort of how Gossip Girl episode is. So I had that math. The math was on the board and we would explain, like I'd explain that in the room because there was no returning writers from the original show because they've all gone on to be show writers themselves, sure. which is amazing because uh, it was a great, great team. Just like, it was like, okay, how do we tell these stories within the framework, within that math? I, it's funny hearing about that framework because yeah, the, the, the party or event is always my favorite. Like, I, I was very happy to see that that element of the show was 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 still there because those are always are like the best scenes in terms of you're seeing people drunk at the party, you're seeing people argue, and it's so it's always there's public embarrassment. It's always great television. So just taking kind of a big step backwards, when did you first know you wanted to be a writer, a storyteller? Were you young? Did it come later on for you? I didn't know I wanted to be a writer. I started working in this business when I was 11, which is very odd. I know. Ah. and I have no family in the business. I was obsessed with movie. I came out of. I came out of my mother obsessed with movies. Nobody knows why. Nobody was obsessed with movies <laughs> in this family. So my mom was getting her nails done. There was a woman next to her who overheard me talking about movies and was like, I work at a studio. Would you like to come take a tour of the studio? So I went to get a tour of the studio, but she was late. So I was sitting in her office and she was late. And there was a script on her coffee table. And I picked it up and I started reading it. And when she came to the office, because I was a very hubristic 11-year-old, <laughs> I put everything wrong with the script. <laughs> so they hired me to be a script reader at 11 for all of their YA properties. Uh, so I was a script reader from 11 until I was 21, basically, at many companies, including Paramount, Fox, and Disney. And then through that, I kind of started to want to be a writer, but I kind of really wanted to be a director. And I, But I applied to, to be a director at college at Tisch, and I got waitlisted for the director's program. But the head of writing saw read my script that I submitted and said, I think you should be a writer instead. And I think I owe him, Mark Dickerman, I owe him everything because he. I went into the writing program at Tisch and then I just became a writer. And by the time I was out of 21, I had an agent. It was crazy to graduate college with an agent. And, and then that was that. So that was my long-winded story wow. for you. No, yeah. I mean, that's that's quite... That's, I've heard a lot of writers tell their you know origin story. And I don't think anybody's ever started by getting hired at 11. So <laughs> from... <laughs> so for, okay, so you get out of college, you already have an agent. From there, what were the sort of practical steps? You know, what, what were the next steps for you in terms of building your career? So I didn't want to go to LA because I didn't know how to drive because I grew up in New York City. And I was like 21, 22. <laughs> too, late to learn. too late to learn. Exactly. My agent was good and got me a deal at Disney uh, writing a movie that was about Senate pages starting World War III. It was a, it was an idea they already had. They just like, <laughs> I think it was called Burning Down the House, which is hilarious. I don't really I'm sure it would have been like Steve Martin and like Queen Latifah uh, or something if it had ever been made. Anyway. It wasn't made, but I think I just started writing features that never got made. I, I wrote for, for 10 years, I wrote features that never got made and it gave me a good living and it you know, got me a house, but it's really you know demoralizing when you tell people what you do for a living, but they're like, what have I seen? And the answer is nothing. And the craziest thing was I had one year where suddenly everything happened for me. I got a pilot picked up and I got a movie picked up that I was going to direct with very huge actors attached to it. I still don't know how it happened. And then in one fell swoop, both of them didn't happen. Uh, and that was like when I was like, because the, the TV show got ungreenlit because it was the last pilot picked up by the WB and they folded the following week. It actually ended up getting picked up by the CW and then it turned out the rights hadn't been negotiated. And my movie fell apart because it was it 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 was a very big movie with very big actors and I was a first-time director and somebody gave me a lot of money and then there was a bit of a financial disaster with the production company and they no longer had that money and the movie just went away. So I kind of sat there in the rubble in my early 30s being like, uh, here, I've been doing this for so long. I've been making money, but and I got finally got close and it still didn't happen. I mean, it really, what happens to writers in this business is very tough because you really can achieve success, but not be successful. Or you could be successful, but not achieve success. 
podcast. It's, it's a, it's very, it's just a really strange place to be in. And you're very privileged and lucky because you're making a living and your friends, maybe my writer friends were not making a living that I went to college with. And they're like, well, at least you're making a living, but you're making a living. But you're like running a relay race all the time and never reaching the finish line, which is really hard. And so when Gossip Girl went, I knew Stephanie because she had been a producer. She worked with McGee. She was his producer. She'd worked with Drew Barrymore's company. So I'd known her through development meetings and all that stuff. And they were like, do you want to come do this for a little while? You know, just come for a season. And that was my first writer's room. And that just changed my career forever. And from there, like suddenly things got made from being on that show and from having that experience. So now I always tell writers, get in a writer's room. Like initially, I would have said, don't, if you're a creator and you're meaning there's a path to be in a writer's room where maybe you aren't a creator, maybe you're not coming up with your own ideas all the time. Maybe you just want to be a writer in a, in a, in a, on a staff and like help sort of learn that way. And there's other people who are like constantly creating. And I used to be like, yeah, create, don't, don't be a part of somebody else's creation. But now I'm always like, no, be a part of somebody else's creation. That's how you learn. And like, I learned so much, you know, I thought I knew everything and I learned so much. So that's interesting. So you mentioned, you know, you have an agent at 21 and you're finding success, even, you know, even though the projects themselves aren't going forward, what is your relationship with your, your, your representation, your agent, your manager? What do you think makes for a good, you know, a good relationship when it comes to your representation? Yeah, I really feel like, you know, I'm really grateful to that agent who was with me for like 10 years. And the agent I've been with now has been with me for like 20 years. I've only been with two agents in my career. It hasn't been that long. That made me, that's actually made me older than I really <laughs> but, but, but the ratios are kind of... You look, uh, you look great for 60. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> but um, what I really, what both of them have, which I'm grateful for all of them have, because now I have a team. And what I really look for is, you don't need somebody whose opinion on your work that you value. Meaning, what I mean by that is, I'm not looking for notes for my agents. I'm grateful to get them because they're incredibly smart people. But what I'm actually looking for are people who understand what I want to do. There are enough executives who are going to give you notes on your scripts, like or they're going to help you get the idea from like you know from the start to the finish. But with agents, what you really want is somebody who understands what you are trying to say who, what, what you mean, what you want to be in the world. Like, I'm very grateful that my agents understand that, okay, I don't want to do teen soaps my whole life. I like doing them, but actually the thing I like doing the most is a different world every time. You know, Quantico is radically different from Smash, is radically different from Gossip Girl. And so my agents understand that I'm not trying to just be the teen soap person. And I feel like that's what I care about the most. Uh, but I also do, I like their notes, like they're listening. <laughs> but I, I like their notes. I'm, I'm just not coming to them and saying, do you think I should write this idea? What do you think of the idea? I'm coming to them to say, I'm interested in this world. Do you think this world is viable in the marketplace? And can you help me since I'm interested in this world, get this world out uh, into the world? And so um, I think that's, and also like, I don't know, I think if you, it should be, everything should be about people. Like I love them as people. I've gone to their weddings. They've been to mine. Like I, you know, I know their families. Like I, I think your representation should feel like they could be a friend of yours. And if they're not, then it's not right. And then one other thing somebody once told me a long time ago, which kind of negates everything I'm about to say, is that the best, <laughs> the best agent is an agent with a coke problem. And I, I <laughs> like, and on some small level, I agree with that. Meaning, you want an agent who's hungry, who wants to succeed, who wants to, you know, who who wants to sell things. <laughs> so, no one uh, who's like, I have my family, I have my house, I have my country house, I'm totally fine. <laughs> you, you want to hustle like the collectors, <laughs> uncut gem. You want uncut gem. Adam Sandler. <laughs> so uh, just you know, a couple of questions before we wrap up. What's your actual writing process like? So on the got on this pilot for this new series of Gossip Girl, do you lock yourself in a room? Do you have crazy whiteboards going? Do you set deadlines for yourself? Are you a morning person? How do you how do you operate? Well, well, I mean, you mean when I wrote the pilot? Because when the writer's room is in, you have a deadline. Yeah, no, no. It, just schedule. when you're you, you alone in a room, like, okay, I've got, I've got an idea. Uh, we'll, yeah. So the first thing I do is I I come up with the characters. They're always first. I and what I do, what, and I, I tell writers to do this too because I think it's really really instrumental. I go online. I find photo, I find actor comps that I think are like the characters. So if I'm going to write something, uh, and and it has a lead that I think Tandy Newton would be right for, I find a photo of Tandy that looks like how I think the character looks. I don't just find a beautiful photo of her. I'm like, okay, did she play a character like this? Or I'll look for like, you know, her in casual clothes, not glammed up because the character's mm -hmm. not glammed up. Then I will print that photo on real, I'll really print it. I won't digitally print it. I will get it printed by, there's only like one place in LA, one place in New York that still does this with the character name on it. And I put that on a wall. So for Gossip Girl, for Soundtrack, for Smash, for everything, every, there are these 
ideas of the people. So while I'm writing, I can look at them and be like, that is the essence. And that's also the actor I hope for. And I've had the good fortune in my career that every time I do this, at least one, if not more actors end up being in the show that I put on my wall. And it's not, I'm not writing it for them. I'm just like, oh, Madeline Stowe actually has the essence of this character, Margot, for soundtrack. And then Madeline Stowe is in soundtrack. Jenna Dewan, same thing, in soundtrack. On Gossip Girl, Evan Mock. Evan had this vibe for Aki. Adam Chandler Barrett, who plays one of the teachers, Jordan, same thing. John Benjamin Hickey, who plays Max's dad, Roy, they were on my wall and they were, they, cause they were the essence of that. And so that really helps me lock in. So when I'm writing, I can look up, I can see them, I can feel them while I'm working. And then from there, I just outline, I have the cards, I do the whole card process. You have to have a whole pork board. I, I'm card based now because in the writer's rooms, it's what you do. You're breaking things. If they're not in cards, they're still in boxes and you're moving them around and you're like, so I do that. And then, um, the outline is the part that takes me the longest. In fact, I often feel like in this business, we should reverse the pilot stage, which is you should get more time, I think, to do the outline than to do the script. The outline is where you truly break the story. It's where you truly find out what it is. And most networks ask for outlines that are like 18 to 25 pages. It makes no sense to expect that in three weeks and for a script to take two months. So <laughs> I always say to them, I will be late on the outline by far, but it will be very full. And I will write the script in three weeks. And I always do. Because my job... Once the show gets picked up, your job as a showrunner is to turn out a script every two or three weeks. Like your vast is the goal. So, so really to me, the, the building, the dreaming is in the outline. So that's what, that's my process. So the outline is really full. Sometimes my lines are 30 pages. Sometimes they have dialogue in them because I'm learning the voices of the characters and I want everyone to know the same voices that I know. So by the time I write, I make a vomit draft, which is you just literally put the outline into final draft and it, and you like... It sometimes it doesn't have the dialogue. It just has like Kate says what mm -hmm. she said in the outline. Kate says, "I wish we hadn't thought of this," and then you have, "I wish we hadn't thought of this in there." And then I go through and find and write from there. That's my template, and that takes me like two or three weeks. And the script's pretty done. That's awesome. So last thing before we let you go, you've been at this for a little while now. You've worked on a bunch of shows. You've yes, created. I'm 60. You've, Remember, I look great for sixty. <laughs> you you created shows. You've worked on shows. You you wrote a bunch of stuff that didn't get made. Is there a lesson you've learned along the way that you wish you could go back to and tell yourself when you were first starting out? Is there a lesson? I honestly think that I, uh, I don't know if it's a lesson, but I but I really believe it's very important to look at what the market wants. If if your goal is to get something made, I think you can pretty much tell the trends of what's out there. Like you you and I'm not saying you have to follow the trends. It's just that we were in a period where antiheroes was what was on the docket. People really wanted antiheroes. Now we're moving into a place where people want a little more fun because the world was very dark for a long period. And I just think it's very important to do to think about that when you're creating. To like you have to be a little bit of a prognosticator. You have to have a bit, a bit of a crystal ball to be like, okay, where will we be six months from now, a year from now? But like right now, I wouldn't write an anti-hero show. I just feel like, like that would be a waste of my time and energy because I just think we've done that a little bit too much. I think right now people want something with a little more heart and a little more hope, even if it has negativity in it. Gossip Girl, they still do terrible things to each other, but there is a little bit of heart in it. And I think that that is why it's right for this moment. We're coming out of COVID. We've all been locked away. No one's had fun. And these characters are able to go out and have fun. And it's this thing of like, just feel where the world is and like whatever your idea is and just make sure you're putting that in a little bit just so that when executives read it, they feel like, yes, this is where I am because you rely so much on what other people think. It really isn't as much as it should be. I love this. I gave birth to it. It's amazing. That part's very important, but it's always somebody else making the decision. If it was you making it, you'd be Howard Hughes and you'd be building everything yourself and making <laughs> yourself or Tyler Perry, but to get there, Tyler Perry still has to go through a whole bunch of executives. So I feel like the thing is just look at the world and make sure that the story you're telling, you're telling through the lens of what you feel the world wants right now. And then if you do that, because you can have your own idea, but you're just like, okay, it should be a little more hopeful or okay, it should be a little darker. You just vibe it out. I wish that I had known that earlier instead of being like, no, I'm going to write this anti-hero. <laughs> Nobody wants anti-heroes, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's awesome advice. The show is on HBO Max right now. I look, I hope we get many seasons of these very attractive teens being terrible to each other. Thank you so much for being on the show. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Thanks to Joshua Safran for coming on the show and taking the time to chat. Gossip Girl is streaming right now on HBO Max. And as always, thanks to you, our listeners. If you like this episode, leave us a review. And if you haven't already, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For news about future episodes and more, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Final Draft Inc. and Instagram at Final Draft Screenwriting. 
This episode was produced by Kayla Guess with help from associate producer Emma Vranich. Music by T. Kelly. Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, right on. Thank you.